And finally, the gospel reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For when I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. May God add his blessing to the hearing and understanding of his word. Amen. Anybody in the mood to pray for the preacher today? I would love to. Okay, Miss Toby. <laughs> Lord, as we come closer to celebrating that moment of moments where your child came to save us, help us to understand that we as a body of Christ are part of what you have for us as a plan in the future. Help us to know that Pastor Terry is leading with all the grace that you can give to her and help us to understand that we are here to support her and each other just as you brought Jesus into our lives to support us. God be with us in the week to come. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, Toby. Now, I've shared with you so many times that I was an English major undergraduate, right? So I'm a grammar nerd and all those things. But one of the worst moments of being an English major was my senior year, second semester, when Dr. Carl Bem, who was one of my favorite professors, said to us, please, please, please take this class, because I need four people to be able to teach this class. And he went to four of his favorite seniors and said, please, 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 please. So I said, all right, and I registered for British Lit of World War I. I cannot tell you how dismal British Lit of World War I is. It's not the most uplifting class. And the literature is not that great and it's sort of down it's a real downer but we did it and then at the end of the semester because you cannot hide when there are four of you in a class there's no way to hide you just cannot you know you can't be invisible you can't sit there and say please don't call on me because he called on everybody and we discussed all the British lit of World War One that there was and at the end of the semester we were getting ready to graduate and he said to us congratulations to the four of you because we we're all getting ready to graduate he said you are now qualified to discuss Chaucer with anyone he said that and maybe 10 sheep, to which one of the guys said, oh, heck no, because he had worked the summer before on a sheep ranch in Canada. And he said, we are not anywhere near qualified to tend sheep. He told us about his experience tending sheep. He said he was butted and bitten and never sat down one time without the sheep wandering out and doing something crazy. And later I found that to be true. When I went to Greece on an all-clergy trip, that's another fun one there, an all-clergy trip to Greece. We were at a gas station having lunch, because that's where you have lunch in Greece, because every gas station seems like it has a little restaurant inside. 
He looked on the hill and there was a shepherd with a staff and a dog and this flock of sheep and everybody ran to that side of the bus. I'm surprised we didn't tip it over because see all these pastors taking pictures and priests taking pictures of sheep. And sheep are not the brightest animal in the world. Can I get an amen on that one? Because one walked up to this edge, this sort of cliff almost, about 16 feet down to the parking lot and looked at it and said, that looks dangerous, and right off the edge. He hit the bottom, his legs said, ah, 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 lay there like that. And the next one looked over and said, that looks dangerous, I think I'll join him. Boom. They start going over the edge, and the shepherd takes his stick and starts hitting the sheep, dogs biting the sheep in the legs, and they're all just trying to go over the edge as quickly as they can. And then I thought, no wonder Jesus calls us his sheep. They're stupid and stubborn and dirty and a mess. That's my life sometimes, right? Stupid, stubborn, and a dirty mess. Anybody else feel that way sometimes? Like you just, you're going to just go over the edge because it's there and it looks dangerous and you're just going to fly off the edge? I guess we are not qualified to tend sheep, and yet God talks about shepherds a lot. Now Ezekiel, Ezekiel's the guy who saw those funky things back in the days before Jesus, right? He saw the wheel in the sky. He saw the valley of the dead bones rise up. And here he's being given, not a vision, but a message from God. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. Now this is because the people that God had put in charge of things were not doing a very good job. God wanted them to lead the people in a certain way and they were leading the people any way but the way they were supposed to go. And so God says, I myself am going to deliver them. I'm going to be like a shepherd to them. Now we tend to think, you know, we have the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But shepherd and king was something that was pretty much understandable in the ancient world. Even those who were not necessarily Jewish faith would see shepherd as a, as a kingly office, even though shepherds were among the lowest of the low in terms of earning potential and job security and all those good things. They were out there with that stick between the sheep and wolves and wild animals and people coming in to steal. They had that stick. But um, this is a shepherd who's going to be the judge of people. I'm going to judge between the fat and the lean, says that shepherd. I will send my servant David, and he shall feed them, and he shall feed them and be their shepherd. What does God want to feed us with? Did you remember what you heard Toby read? I will feed them with justice. Justice is important to God. We see that most clearly in the Matthew section we read today. The third of three parables we've read from the 25th chapter of Matthew over the last three weeks, and this is the end of Matthew, because next week we start Advent, which is the beginning of the Christian year. We move to Mark's Gospel. And Matthew took us up to chapter 26, is the beginning of the Passion of our Lord. So these are things that have occurred after Jesus entered Jerusalem. He's had the triumphal entry. He's been in the temple teaching. He's kicked out the money changers. All these things have happened, and now he taught. What was the first one we read a couple weeks ago? Anybody remember last week's lesson? Do, 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 do. You weren't here, Ivan. You got a free pass on that one. But um, in the 25th chapter of Matthew, three very distinct passages about the end times. The one was the ten bridesmaids, five who had the oil, five who did not, the wise and foolish ones. Then last week, what do we read? Crickets, 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 crickets. Oh my goodness gracious. You can open up your Bibles if you want. It's an open book test here. Anybody have a Bible there? You want to look up that, that second story from Matthew chapter 25? I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to look it up on your own. How's that? Oh, Bibles are coming out of the pews. What? The talents. Yes. Remember we talked about the parable of the talents? How the landowner went away and he left a large sum of money entrusted to his slaves. How much was the talent? It was a boatload of money, right? A big old bucket of money. And he leaves five with one, two with one, and one with the other. And he expected a return on his money when he came home. We said it wasn't about money, it was about the gifts of God, right? Grace and mercy and justice and all those things. And then we end with this both hopeful and very threatening passage. 
about the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep is right hand, the goats is left. This is Jesus coming before the nations as king. And this is following his resurrection from the dead because that is how God's power is shown through raising Christ from the dead. And what's going to happen then? He's going to separate him out, and he's going to say to the ones on his right, come into my kingdom, you who are blessed by my Father. Where do we hear blessings in Matthew? Remember back at the um, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed are you and people revile you and persecute you, all those great things we heard and said, it doesn't sound like you're being blessed, does it? But come in, those of you who are blessed, because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Now, in prison in those days, it wasn't like you served a long sentence in prison and the state took care of you. Prison was usually more of a holding cell for somebody until they were tried and either executed or set free, basically, or had some great punishment put on them. But you know how you ate in prison in those days? You had a family who came to feed you. And if you had no family, you did not eat. And Jesus says, go and feed them. Whether they're guilty or innocent, go feed them. Jesus says to feed the people. He doesn't say feed the righteous, doesn't say feed the ones who are worthy of being fed, does he? He says, I was hungry and you fed me. He said, when do we ever see you that way? And he said, what? When you feed the least of these who are hungry, when you give comfort to the least of these who are my brothers and my sisters, you have done it to me. And what does he say about the others? I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat, nothing to eat. I was naked and you gave me nothing to put on. I was in prison and sick and you did not visit me. Thirsty, you didn't give me anything to eat or to drink. And they said, when would we see you like that, Lord? Because if you saw Jesus sitting in the street, hungry and cold, you'd take him in, wouldn't you? I love little kids when they come up for children's sermons. The littlest ones, when you say, what do you do if somebody's sick? You take care of them. What do you do if they're hungry? You feed them. What do you do if they don't have a place to live? This answer every time, you know what it is? Somebody doesn't have a place to live, you take them home to live with you. That is who Christ is for us, the one who takes us in, the one who loves us. But we don't, we don't think that way, do we? We think if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're not so good, you go to the other place, right? We bring it down to personal piety. If you cuss, fool around, smoke, drink, all that stuff, you're not going to heaven, right? God help you if you're gay, you're not going to heaven, right? Or if you're this or that or the other, you're not going to go to heaven, right? What if Jesus means it this way? What if he means if we withhold compassion from each other? What if it's that we're withholding caring from one another? What if those are the things that break his heart and make him push us to the side? What's the title of the sermon today? Oh, that we might listen to him. That came from the psalm this morning. Psalm 95, for he is our God, we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Listen to his voice. What is Christ saying to us? But the way we treat each other is what he cares about. The way we show compassion to one another. We feed each other with justice. Because that's what he wants to have, justice. It's not about judging other people. It's not about what they've done right or wrong. It is about how we are to be with other people. Because the world's got to change, folks, or it's not going to be here much longer. And when Christ returns, that's a good thing. And I'm looking to that day, and next week we start saying, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, four Sundays of Advent. I told you before, Advent is not the baby shower for the Virgin Mary. It is the time when we prepare ourselves to receive Christ in the second coming which means we have to treat other people with kindness and love and generosity. I told you last week something that scares me. Melissa Fagenbaum, our preschool director, begged her parents not to go to temple for the first time ever because she was afraid what might happen to them because they're Jews, and right now Jews are not very welcome in our society. Or Muslims, that little boy who was stabbed to death by his landlord because he was Muslim. 
people who are hated who are Asian Americans, people who are hated who are black skinned people and dark skinned people. We have got to say no to that in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, we've got to say no to anti Semitism. We gotta work to make everyone in this nation feel welcome. Because we do have a king, don't we? We have a king and his name is Jesus Christ. He's our savior. He's the one that Christ, that God raised from the dead to show the power that he has over sin and death. Now, there's a new word that's come into the world. It's called kingdom. Anybody heard of kingdom? Because there are people who think, I don't want a king because I'm an American. I'm an American. We don't like kings here, do we? We're, we're independent. Don't tread on me, all that good stuff. And kingdom means that there's everybody sort of on an equal playing field, which is what the kingdom of God will be like. But I'm sorry, I need a king. I don't know about you. I need somebody who is in charge. Somebody I can turn to and say, this is the answer. This is what I need to do with my life. That for me is Jesus Christ, who is my king. He wants us to live together in a kingdom with one another, but make no mistake about it, he has got to be the king, or we have no hope at all. It's a hard way to end the Christian year, isn't it, with this passage? Because what are we to do? Ephesians gives us the answer for that. We're to open our eyes. With the eyes of our hearts and light, we may know the hope to which he has called us. What are the riches of this glorious inheritance among the saints? Was the immeasurable greatness of his power for those of us who believe according to the working of his great power. That's what it means. I said a couple weeks ago to be woke doesn't mean to be politically correct or anything like that. It means to just be aware of what's happening in the world. To open your eyes to other people's suffering. To open your eyes to what happens in the world. So keep your eyes open, folks, and look for Christ in each other. Look for Christ in the mirror every day because you will see him there. I see him in you richly. I see Christ at work in this congregation when we have 65 bags of groceries that went out to families in the neighborhood who didn't have a Thanksgiving dinner without it. And the, how many shoe boxes this year, Shilda? Shilda. Frida. How many? 58 shoe boxes that went around the world. Shelda was one of my members of my last church. I dearly loved her. And I look at Frida sometimes and call Shelda. They don't look alike at all. And I tell, I did call Shelda Frida the last time I talked to her, so don't feel bad about it. But when we send things like that into the world, when we care for the people who come to Thrifty Penny, we give them what they need instead of charging them for what they need. We are showing Christ to the world. I'm not telling you to accept things that you don't think are right in the world. I'm telling you to love everybody who comes in the doors of this place because that is who are called to be in Jesus Christ. To feed each other with justice. To care for those who are in need because that is what makes our king happy. That's how you bow down to Christ. You don't have to, you don't have to turn around in circles and stick your tongue out. Sorry there, Clark. But you've got to care for people when they're in need. Amen? Amen.